Dr. McGill, thank you so much for chatting with me today. This is such an honor to have you on the show. So thank you for taking the time to, uh, to chat with me. Yeah, good morning or good evening, uh, Jackie, and it's my pleasure. Wonderful. Let's get straight in. Firstly, how does one become the world-renowned expert on backs? How? Well, uh, there's, uh, like everything else, several uh, elements. And the first will sound odd, but I'm going to say luck and karma of life. So you meet the right people at the right time with the right swirl of events and your life evolves. So that is is a huge uh, part, but you need the personality to take advantage of those opportunities as they uh, present. But from the experiential part, Uh, I got a PhD in spine biomechanics and started a laboratory where it was kitted out to measure the loads on internal tissues of people doing things. And uh, obviously it was spine centric. So we would learn on why specific movement techniques created stress points in uh, side on certain tissues and certain types of uh, disorders, as you're aware, spine issues cluster around specific sports for a reason. There's a chronic exposure of a certain type in uh, fast bowlers in cricket versus cross fitters versus long distance runners versus rugby players and soccer players. They all have clustering uh, of syndromes, if you want to call them that, around their sport because of the chronic stresses. So the second lab I then realized I had to develop was where we would understand the progressions leading to pain. So I would take cadaveric spines. So obviously an entirely different setup, acquire the spines, put them into different loading jigs, repeat the mechanical insults, and uh, the stresses would accumulate leading to very specific things like spondylolisthesis and stress fractures or herniated discs. And then it turns out there's all sorts of subcategories of disc herniations that are consistent with various very specific types of uh, exposures. And then we built a radiology suite so we could, with more precision, measure the breakdown of tissues, which you can't see on MRIs and things like that. And then in the end, we had the advantage of doing micro dissection. So I know there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, there's no visible damage on an MRI. There's lots of damage that Mm -hmm. at at the micro level is not visible and the sportsman is unaware of the cumulative micro damage and they don't time their rest and adaptation to address the cumulative element from the exposure. So they don't quite optimize the work and the rest uh, elements, but we were able to track that and and learn a, a fair bit. And the last bit, to answer your question, how I would have to say is just personality. And it's been my personality with all things that if I were a master it and become a master of the craft. So I've spent the last 40 years trying to master the craft of assessing an individual's back pain and then learning the best approach for that individual on how to reduce the cause and uh, build a foundation for them to create a resilient body. So uh, that, and that's there's it. the how. <laughs> that, 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 that's it. Brilliant. Other than that, uh, other than that, it's a walk in the park. <laughs> exactly. Anyone can do it. Yeah. After 40 years, you can do it too. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Brilliant. Well, tell us, you, um, one thing that you always say is all back pain has a cause. How do we determine where the pain is, what's causing it? And then obviously how to fix it. Right. It's through a very robust assessment. Now, 
there is nowhere in the traditional medical system that provides for a robust spine assessment. So if you're a, a doc or a surgeon or a family doc, uh, you're paid through codes, medical codes. So if you perform this procedure, you get paid. Do you know there's no code for a thorough back assessment? So sometimes uh, I will spend a couple of hours doing a thorough assessment on uh, back pain. You know, uh, it's interesting. It, you know what the NBA is, the National Basketball Association. When the players are traded, the team purchasing a player sends out their medical staff to review the player. Well, one of the uh, people who is very well known for doing shoulder and upper quarter assessments uh, is a former student of mine. And then he became such a master of the craft, he would spend half an hour measuring the shoulder and arm on one side and then a half an hour on the other side. Oh, By wow. the time you get through the history, the anatomy, the neurology, uh, et cetera, he was pretty good at sourcing out whether this uh, athlete, this asset was going to be resilient uh, or not. And uh, it, it, so now I have a spine, uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, we've just been through the Olympics and, mm -hmm. and we've just seen some spectacular performances Incredible. and I'm getting a bit off topic here, but you know, when someone is sprinting at the top end, people don't realize that these guys are 40 kilometers an hour and stick your head out the car window at 40 kilometers an hour and you start to appreciate the athleticism <laughs> yeah. and the micro tearing that is occurring in that athlete. So then you have a hundred meter woman or man, and then they run the hundred meter relay. People don't realize the micro trauma that's occurring. And now those tissues are, uh, they have to cool their jets for a while. Otherwise uh, they're in trouble. So um, getting back to all back pain has a cause. Uh, we find the cause through uh, We've developed a, a very robust assessment. And the assessment starts with an interview. And uh, I'll have someone come in and I'll say, well, tell me your story. Why are you here? And they might talk for three sentences or they might talk for 30 minutes. And then uh, they, they, by the way, this is all set up. They sit in front of a fireplace. I'm off at 45 degrees. It's all highly engineered, that session to extract information and I need them to tell me the impediments of why they've failed in the past, the nature of the pain, something about their training and their personality. Who are their friends? Are they a group of CrossFitters, which are all keen go get them types? Or are they surrounded by enablers who, oh, you've got back pain, sit down and let me feed mm -hmm. you another chocolate, you poor little thing. <laughs> you, you, you know, so you've got to understand what is determining the successes and failures. And uh, then uh, I, after hearing the reports of their pain, I have some hypotheses and they come downstairs here to uh, our assessment room where you will see uh, an assessment table in front of a squat rack with uh, 1200 pounds with all sorts of loading machines and belt squats and you name it, as we go through BackFit Pro down that way. So I provoke their pain, and it shows me the postures, the tissues, uh, with real precision, what is causing their pain. We pull on different nerve roots, uh, and then we try and search for the antidote. So if they say, uh, getting out of the chair triggers my pain and I see them sitting with their knees together and they get out of the chair and then we find out maybe they have a posterior disc bulge with an open fissure and their first move is to go into flexion and then they stand up and I'll say really hmm. spread your knees apart suck a little bit of air be a peacock lead with your chest now pull your hips through Oh, doc, you're magical. You just took my pain away. No, I didn't. I did a thorough assessment to understand the precise cause of your pain. And we engineered a movement hack around that mechanism. So they've been turned into a victim 
by their pain. In fact, they show signs of PTSD. Mm. They, if I came to you and throughout the day, I would sneak up behind you with a bat and I'd whack you on the back of the head. You don't know when that bat is coming and you suffer. You're a victim. That's back pain to the person who has been told, oh, you're a pain magnifier. It's in your head posture, doesn't matter. All this kind of nonsense. They've become a psychological victim. But when you get, perform a thorough assessment and show them with precision what causes their pain, and then you repeat the activity with a strategy that takes their pain away, you've changed them and empowered them into someone who now is in control. And they, some of them become very angry and they say, oh, my physical therapist said, it's okay to slouch, it's okay to do this and that. And when I show them that they can avoid their pain triggers by moving in ways to migrate the stresses away from their pain mechanisms, as I said, they become very empowered and some of them get angry at how they've been treated in the past. And some of them say, you know, thank you. You're the first guy who hasn't treated me like a five-year-old. Yeah. You've explained to me what my mechanism of pain is. And I get it. I know exactly what to do now. So next time I get pain, that means something different to me. I'm no longer out of control and a victim mm. of that pain. I am in control. I screwed up. I <laughs> caused the pain. I'm going to repeat that activity now in the way that McGill or one of our <laughs> clinicians has shown them. We do have some uh, clin McGill method clinicians in uh, Australia now. And uh, they'll say, okay, I'm going to put that success into muscle memory. I'm going to repeat that movement mm. now a few times, pain-free. And now, so do you see, is that a psychological intervention or is it a physical movement skill intervention? Is it biomechanics? Is it sociology? Is it psychology? I hope you see it's all of the above. All of the above, yeah. So anyway, uh, all back pain has a cause. You need an assessment to understand the mechanism, which will show you a way around it most of the time. Now, shit happens. There are some <laughs> people does. who uh, are, uh, they're, they're going to struggle and we'll have to use different techniques. We, we might just desensitize their pain just by not triggering it. Stop stubbing your toe and your toe pain goes away is <laughs> yeah. basically your, you know, if you keep biting your lip, you get a fat, angry lip. So stop it. Um, or, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a variety of mm. uh, interventions and people will say, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, I can give you an example where uh, a certain type of uh, uh, tissue based therapy might be exactly what they need to help that tissue start to desensitize. So I don't. Uh, I'm not married to anything. I'm only married to understanding the mechanism and then figuring out the best approach. I love that. Please explain load because I think if I think a lot of people who go to the gym would automatically assume going over to the squat rack and loading up the barbell is load. Yes. Is that it? It's a great question. That's a great start. Yeah, that's it. But that's the beginning of it. So uh, I hold uh, a coffee mug and let's just say it weighs a kilo. So the load is one kilo. However, if I'm going to stand up now and I'm going to put that one kilo in my hand, there's a load on my elbow, but it's magnified times 15. So let's assume my bicep is the motor and cable that lifts my arm to support that coffee cup of one kilo. Agreed? Yeah. I'm going to turn on my bicep to hold that static load. But the distance of that bicep in front of the mechanical fulcrum of the joint is only one fifteenth of the distance of that coffee cup. So I need 15 times the load. Let's say the coffee weighed five pounds. I'll work in, in pounds here. I need 75 pounds of force in my bicep now to hold a five pound coffee cup. Now, if I hold it at a different angle, I need much less load in my bicep. 
So if I perform a poor lift with a long lever arm, it's very easy to sustain half a ton of compressive load down my back. But if I organize that load and thrust line closer, so I might do a back squat, a front squat, a hex bar squat, whatever, I'm manipulating that thrust line and where it drives through my back, which has incredible compounding effects on the internal load, the load on the tissues, and that's the, what matters. So there's a beginning of the discussion. We live in a linkage and any external load works to create internal loads and it's those internal loads that create pain. So I'm gonna push a door, look at my hand, I'm gonna create a force vector right through my spine. It doesn't cause any load. But if I push out here, the reaction of my body now is to push my body away. So now I need a hell of a lot of muscle buttressing to push a load out here in an incredible magnification of that external force is now internally loaded. So mechanics matter hugely. Technique wins. I mean, if now you will have people in Australia who say, oh, posture doesn't matter. And I'll say, really come to jujitsu class <laughs> with me. And there will be a little tiny black belt in jujitsu who will have you screaming like a baby by taking a little posture and a tiny bit of load and they will tear your joints to pieces. <laughs> you will be crying on the ground, submitting immediately. Now that's the beginning of load magnitude. But athletes and your audience get in trouble with doing light magnitude loads but for a long time. So now the next part of the load discussion is duration. So if I was to sit slouched for a long duration, tissues creep at the micro level. And there are certain injuries that only become painful after 20 minutes of being loaded at a low level. So now it's magnitude and now it's duration. The next element is repetition. So repetition accumulates and adds to the load. Now, the curious thing is all of this load magnification with repetitions and time is mitigated by rest. So your body thrives on load. The language of cells and adaptation is force, pressure, stress. If you never created internal loads, you'd be a very unhealthy beast and very fragile. So you stimulate through loading the signaling required for those tissues to gain strength and the cells to become robust. Only the adaptation takes place during rest. So a crossfitter sometimes crosses the line. They think more is better. And it breaks my heart when I will see uh, someone with bravado, usually someone who's a bit younger and say, oh, I did this at CrossFit on Monday. I did this on Tuesday. Wednesday was my day off. I only ran 5K. Silly idiot. Every great religion has a day of rest in the week. When you study adaptation, a day of rest is not a 5K run. A day of rest is a day of rest to truly adapt the tissues that you've been stimulating and signaling to adapt. You must allow the adaptation to occur. So the rest and relaxation and some of those techniques are extremely important uh, as well. So, and I talked about the specificity of back injuries. There's compression down the spine mm -hmm. and then there's shear. Watch that joint right there. Do you see it shearing? So yeah. that joint has been damaged and it's got micro movements to it. Guess where the pain comes from? To the joint that's been damaged. You don't see this on MRI. It's a yeah. loss of stiffness. Uh, but my point is now load matters in terms of its mode. Is it in compression, tension, bending, shear, mm. torsion, twist, uh, combinations of those? So uh, again, the very thorough assessment is... Uh, it, it's quite rare, it's key. but yeah, but uh, load is a very, very important construct. Mm. And um, you mentioned sitting down 
let's just say someone sitting down for a long period, that loading is not good for a, a spine, correct? Well, it could be. It could be. The answer is it depends. Okay. So you know, you know, couch potatoes, very unfit people who can sit all day with impunity. Sitting doesn't bother them. They right. can watch TV all day and eat chips and all the rest <laughs> of it. They don't have back pain. But look at that poor CrossFitter who works in the office eight mm. hours a day, a slave to the computer, sitting and sitting hurts them. And then yeah. they go and do rounds of Olympic lifts and burpees and, uh, you know, all sorts of hanging kips and you get it. And they have back pain. Isn't that so unfair? That <laughs> it really <sitting> is. <laughs> hurts. But my point is for the couch potato, sitting didn't matter yeah. because they didn't have accumulative stress. So now I'm going to show you what's going on with that mechanism, because this is very common among CrossFitters. So there, these models I'm showing you are the most biofidelic models to explain pain uh, once it's subcategorized. So here's probably the most common CrossFit injury that I have to deal with. So there is a spinal unit, the spinal cord slides up and down, as you know, and inside the disc, which is not a ball and socket, it's an adaptable fabric. So the, the disc is made up of collagen fibers, like a fabric, and uh, fabric delaminates. So if I took my jacket, very nice Alico lifting jacket, by the way, we, we're, we, we're, we're sponsored here at BackFit Pro by several outstanding manufacturers. So we don't have anything that we don't agree with and use, but Alico bars are the best uh, for Olympic bars. But anyway, so now I'm going to create stress strain reversals on this lovely jacket. I will wear a hole right there. So the fabric delaminates. So if the CrossFitter doesn't pay attention to form, but here's the unique thing of CrossFit and it's fatigue. They start out lifting well, and then fatigue causes their form to break. And slowly, that movement will cause delaminating stresses in those collagen fibers. Now, those collagen fibers contain a hydraulic disc nucleus in the center. That's hydraulic fluid. So the external load creates a magnified internal load and a huge hydraulic pressure inside the nucleus. Now you start working the collagen fibers back and forth and they slowly loosen. So it's the ground substance between the fibers and some of the fibers will actually micro fracture at the Sharpies uh, fibers where they attach to the bone. So we get micro breaks in the bone. Again, you don't see this on MR, you'll see some of the edema or in a bone scan, you'll see the heat and metabolic activity. Slowly, the collagen will delaminate and you get, see that little red delamination? Now mm -hmm. let's create some hydraulics here. I'm gonna move the nerves out of the way. I'm going to squeeze the joint and bend forward. So they're getting tired now. They're doing a bit more butt wink in a squat <laughs> or a bit more flexion when they lift. Do you see the delamination yeah. opening? Not now. And the hydraulic uh, pressure pushing the gel out the back onto the nerve root. So that's the mechanism of a disc herniation and the primary uh, injury to a CrossFitter. Now watch, I'm going to give you the mechanical antidote and it's posture. So now if I had an orange seed and I wanted to squirt the orange seed that way, I would bias my pressure here and it would go that way every single time. But if I create a thrust line down the center, I lock it. And we do that exactly through coaching. So if I was to lift, I would be peacock and pull with the hips, 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 hips. But when I get tired and I round out, that was the mechanism that I just showed you. And people yeah. will say, oh, well, uh, he did it and he didn't get in trouble. But that was exactly the same argument used for smoking for years. <laughs> My uncle smoked for 30 years and never got cancer. Yeah. I know because it's a delayed cumulative effect as we talked about load mm -hmm. earlier. The effect, is, you, you can pay me now or you can pay me later <laughs> as the saying goes. But eventually it'll get you.
So anyway, now I'm going to give you the antidote. So now we're going to stack the spine tall and I'm going to squeeze and notice the whole disc squeezes, but nothing is opened up in the delamination in the back and there's no pressure on the nerve root problem solved. So there, uh, uh, is uh, an example, if, if you will, on uh, herniation and uh, how you can control the internal yeah. loads through technique, through rest. Uh, over time, by the way, once a person has that open fissure and delamination, uh, nature will turn it to crab meat. So it's a, it's a gel, it looks like uh, a very viscous phlegm, if you like, uh, but it'll eventually turn to more of a crab meat and it'll form a plug and then the person becomes resilient. So I, I had a couple of those as a younger man. Uh, now I have zero, basically, I'm in my middle 60s. Uh, it's all, you don't find older people my age with open fissures in their discs anymore. They, they plug up. But you also move properly. <laughs> So even if you had them, well, I, I haven't always, and I'm still a stupid man yeah. to remember this. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> so my, my, my passion in life now is uh, I have to start training for this. So yeah, obviously I'm a Canadian and I live in middle Ontario. So we have a pretty good cold winter. Our lakes are frozen half, half the year, six months. And the other six months is, is a really nice summer. Um, but my passion is, do you know what a snowmobile is? It's like oh. a dirt bike on snow, yeah. Yeah. kind of. So, yeah. yeah, but you you have to be pretty fit to control, you know, oh, is that a, right? couple, a couple hundred horsepower on one of those. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous uh, crotch rocket on snow, <laughs> if you want to think of it as that. So I, I have to start my training now to get ready for the snowfall at the end of November. What, so this uh, is like a sport? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you jump over that picnic table? <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm riding with a bunch of 20 and 30-year-olds, yeah, the old man's not going to be left behind. <laughs> oh, wow. But anyway, my, my, my point is uh, I'm still a stupid man, obviously. <laughs> that, point. That's, yeah, that, that's not good for me. Yeah. But uh, I say, well, it's an excuse for me to train. It gives me a very purposeful training goal. Mm. And, uh, you know, if I go out for a, th a three-hour ride, I've probably done 3,000 squats, loaded squats on a machine riding the, the yeah, rails wow. with your feet and uh, to control with the uh, torques and uh, the postures. And I get into some pretty awkward postures. Yeah. Or well, I have to ask then, you said you have to start your training for that. Yeah. What does that entail? Right now? Yeah. Um, okay. That's uh, another quite major uh, discussion. Is it? And yes, it is. Of course it is. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what's a training program? When, I, when an athlete comes in here and I'll say to them, okay, you've got back pain, but let me know something else here. It's very important. If I was a magician or a genie and I could bestow upon you one athletic gift, what would that be? And if the athlete can't answer that immediately, I'll say, fire the coach. You, you're telling me you don't know what your training goal is? Do you, do you see the point? Mm. So you have to know what you're training for, because biology is not infinite. We're going to talk about tuning a runner and a CrossFitter and a weightlifter and all the rest of it to tune. Those are three different demands. You can't have it all. You've got to be very focused. If you're going to live to uh, 70 and 80 and be the most rocking granddad on this planet, otherwise you, you're going to be a basket case. Yeah. So when you asked me about my training and I know it was probably came from a little bit of a, a Ignorance? <laughs> well, I was going to say a little bit more of a fr frivolous kind of thing. The magnitude of the question you just asked is enormous. Being in my middle 60s, my training program is very, very specific. 
and it follows a seven day cycle. So I do heavy physical work uh, every day anyway. Apart from that, two days a week, I strength train. Now, if I've split firewood for four hours, I don't need to strength train. That is it. But you get what I mean. Mm. Two days a week, I work on things that are a bit stuck. So I have to work on my neck, my hips, my hands, uh, my shoulders. Uh, And uh, two days a week, I do something for my ticker something that gets my so if I haven't done anything physical for a couple of days that really gave me a cardiovascular load and challenge then I'll go ride my bike or I'll go cross-country ski or do you see what I mean Mm. so and then the seventh day I rest I I'm lazy that day (laughs) but I don't have any I don't have any pain I'm reasonably strong. I can still arm wrestle. <laughs> so locally here and in, in, in the pub for, you know, over 60 year olds, I don't do too badly. But my, anyway, my, my point is there is a training program for me now in my stage of life. Mm-hmm. Number one, know your goals, know your age, know your injury history, and to program good exercise for optimal performance and resilience is uh, requires some mastery of the craft. Mm. Yeah. I'll tell you with, I get about 200 requests every day from around the world for consults. The majority of them are caused by physical therapists and trainers who don't understand programming. That's quite a statement. Yeah huge i also have to ask i don't have many opinions do i <laughs> <laughs> well you are the world expert <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well says you you should talk to my wife <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you're such an idiot why would they listen to you no i, I no, she she doesn't say that i'm i i'm joking when will you um you know you're doing all this training when you first get on the snowmobile, how long will you spend on it? Oh, what a lovely question. So that's called graded exposure. So the first time when I was younger, I would just go <laughs> like hell. For this machine this year, I'm compelled. I, I can only go for an eight to 10 minute heat cycle. You're right. tempering down the engine and you're tempering your body as well. And the, the other key is don't ride two days in a row. What a no-no. So I will ride and then the next day, see how I'm feeling. And uh, if I'm feeling great, fabulous, but don't do any more. That's the mistake that a lot of people make in their rehab and they're, when they're ramping up their training program. Uh, that's your adaptation day. So day one, if I only ran uh, just like around the, the, the road here uh, for 10 minutes, uh, I've stimulated my body to start to adapt and gain some resilience. I got to allow the adaptation to occur. Mm. So that's day two. Day three, I might do two heat cycles and uh, I'm, I'm having a good rip for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour. Day four, it's my audit day. How am I feeling? Darn that that hip has got a bit of funk to it. I'm 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 going to do whatever is appropriate for that hip now. Or I'm feeling fabulous, great, but I'm going for a walk that day and a cross country ski. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm not. So it's an alternate day exposure. And the older you get, you, you gain this wisdom. And uh, I, I I don't. Even if I'm splitting wood, I don't do it two days in a row yeah. and I don't get sore. So every, every other day. Yeah. Yeah. Proximal stiffness and stability. Can you explain this concept? Yes. We live in a linkage. Our skeleton is a linkage. If I tried to pull on a door and I didn't create proximal stability and I pulled on the door, the door would pull me. 
Have you ever tried to stand up in a canoe and fire a gun? <laughs> it wouldn't work. But off the deck of a battleship, it's beautiful. So proximal stiffness. If I wanted to wiggle my finger fast, which is distal athleticism, the end of my linkage, my hands, my feet, my shins, my forearms, these are all distal. If I wanted to wiggle a distal item in the linkage quickly, I had to stiffen my wrist. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. So all movement in a linkage, and this is a law, it's the law of linkage mechanics. You have to create proximal stiffness to allow distal athleticism. So we've just been through the Olympics. And as you can imagine, it's a busy time for me with all the consulting that goes into dealing with some of these athletes and tuning proximal stiffness. So a sprinter, in order to get enormous acceleration, the gluteals fire, but if they bend the spine, I just lost speed. If I lock the spine, 100% goes to propelling the uh, femur. So let me take an easier example now with a uniarticular muscle like a pec major. So let's say we'll go back 40 years and I'm going to bench press 300 pounds, which I could do at that time. Of course, I can't now. I'm going to build a beautiful bench press muscle, a uniarticular pec. Distal to the ball and socket, the pec major flexes my arm. We all agree. That's what I want. I want to be able to push or throw a punch or whatever. Proximally, that muscle connects to my rib cage. Look, look what it does. It bends my rib cage towards my shoulder. So if all I use is my bench press muscle, I just collapse. Isn't that a skillful push? No, it's, you know, it's horrible. But if I create proximal stiffness and I lock down proximally and I don't allow my spine to bend, 100% goes to the distal athleticism. That is proximal stability. So the next time you're watching uh, Serena Williams, well, if, if you can still catch her, she's not around much these days, but nonetheless, listen to the grunt when she serves the tennis ball. <clears throat> she is, this is called active expiration, which stiffens her core even more. And it allows more miles an hour of rotational speed distal to her shoulder and a few more miles an hour on the ball. The grunt is a trick to create even more proximal stiffness. So athletes use and take advantage of this manipulation of proximal stiffness throughout the body. Now, a cricket bowler or a golfer uses a very different strategy to create proximal stiffness. So a golfer tunes the elasticity, they store elastic energy, and then they unleash the elastic energy, but not by using muscle because muscle will stiffen them and slow them down. If you ever try to hit a golf ball with effort and muscle, it doesn't go very far. So to uncork the elastic energy stored, but right at ball contact, there's a pulse. Poof! And you measure this in the great long distance ball hitters. So there is a pulsed proximal stiffness. So when you measure the great athletes, you, you learn these principles and laws of the linkage, but it's different in the expression of the uh, athleticism, whether it is a pulsed event like, say, let's do an Olympic, we'll get back to CrossFit, let's do a snatch. Mm. You create the wedge and you create enough stiffness proximally, and then you unleash the hips and then you have to completely relax to catch the bar. And if you don't relax, you have stiffness and you're slow and you lose the lift. So it's a tremendous pulsed proximal stiffness. Proximal stiffness, unleash the hips, relax, supreme stiffness, catch. And now you pull the hips through and up you come. So do you see how interesting these discussions get? And all you asked Absolutely. about was all you get all you asked about was explained proximal stiffness. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I really 
uh, that would be a, a three-hour university <laughs> lecture to start to scratch yeah. the surface. Yeah. No, I love it. And the examples make it um, much easier to understand, I must say, although applying it <laughs> sounds really um, difficult as well if, if I were to try and figure that out. But well, the examples if you know how fantastic. to coach, if you know how to coach, it isn't. Mm, yeah. Yeah, well, let's, that's the um, skill of great coaching. Absolutely. Uh, I'd love to talk about weight machines at the gym, especially at the moment here in Sydney, we're in lockdown. So all the gyms are closed and people are working from home. And so, you know, sitting down at desks and computers for long periods. And then, you know, eventually when things open up, what would you say to those heading back into the gym who want to use um, a seated machine like, you know, your leg presses or your um, hamstring curl, seated hamstring curls, these seated machines, what would you say to be on the lookout for when getting back into the gym? Okay. Well, are, a- are these problematic, the seated stuff? Mm-hmm. The answer is that really it depends. There's no right answer to this, but it does deserve a discussion. What is the person's goals? Why are they training? Now, most will say, oh, I want to look good at the beach. I want biceps. I want some nice abs. And uh, that's it. Uh, Very rarely do you hear a performance goal or will they even say, you know, I want to train to get rid of my back and shoulder pain or I I want to be more resilient. Now, these are the things that I'm very interested in. So uh, I can get a lot of work done with body weight. I can create a core of iron, very resilient spine through floor exercise. I can uh, give me a tree and a TRX strap, a kettlebell, it's not much. There's no excuse why you can't have that at home. So I can create tremendous uh, programming and and really some elite athleticism. But if I want to go sit in a machine and talk to my friends and that kind of thing, there's a time and a place. So if we have a, a damaged rotator cuff that's going to require some rehab, I can use a belt squat machine. I can even use some Cybex equipment for hips and knees, and I can keep those going you follow. So do you see why machines when used strategically can be very helpful? Mm. Or I might have to create some balance in the body. They are overpowered in one part of their body and underpowered in another part. Now, free exercise will balance that out, but I might add a little bit of what's called auxiliary work with a machine. Um, But you know, when I see someone come, coming in with jacked muscles and they go up and they're picking up 200 kilo off the ground in a deadlift and they go to an over hunter hook and they've got little computer hands, get some big mitts, son, and start to learn how to bring your body into balance because you can't use that athleticism if you don't have a pair of grippers. It will always define all this beauty bodybuilding that you've been doing because you can't put it into play. You're on a rugby pitch, you better have a good set of grippers. You get what I mean? So uh, I will then use, will I use a machine? Well, we call it sword play. I will get an iron bar, maybe uh, 40 centimeters long. And now we figure eights, start to build a gripper. And then if all you grip is a, is a machine handle that round, you've got no hope got to grip fat things, skinny things, learn to manipulate. I'm going to break your grip. We're going to shake hands. And then I'm going to coach you how to use your little finger, the next one, the next one, the next one, every single finger, and then squeeze through the hand, which is where the strength is. And then we add more strength as we distally uh, migrate away from the strength of the hand into the fingers. So grip strength, there's so much science to it. Do I need machines? Well, give me an iron bar and we'll do it. Give me a concrete block and we'll do it. So you you get where I'm coming from. Yeah. 
don't walk to the machines when you don't need them. You'd, you'd be better off. When prepping yourself for the specific training, the specific workout, do you do stability specific stuff to warm up or get you ready for that particular workout or do you just whatever it is that you're doing what's the answer you're starting to get me no it depends yeah of (laughs) course so i need to know something about the person their history what their goals are and that kind of thing and we're going Mm. to tune their body but because we live in a linkage everybody needs a certain amount of core stability otherwise they're weak and uh not very resilient. So that's non-negotiable. We, uh, for 30 years, looked for ways to create core athleticism, of which stability is a very large compart- component, uh, trying to find out what is the best way to create that in the most spine sparing way, because biology only gives us so much training capacity. And I want the training capacity for speed and power and all of these other things. I don't want to use it up doing core work. <laughs> that's, that, that's just the foundation that allows the athleticism to express in a resilient way. The big three which you may be familiar with, was what we kept converging on and kept bubbling up to the top. It guarantees stability, and it builds it in a very spine-conserving way. In fact, it even builds training capacity. So the bird dog, the side plank, and the curl up. Now, if you have a knee replacement, the bird dog is now off the table. So you might want to do a standing bird dog against a table. You get what I mean. Uh, or you've got a rotator cuff damage. You can't do a side plank for a while. So we might get out a total back, which is a machine that I can show you if you wish. It's just to the right of the the screen here. Um, Or uh, no, I've got a sore neck and I can't do the modified curl up. So we might switch it up into a dead bug and we'll figure out what's going on with the neck and we'll do some neck prehab exercise. For example, I might figure out that they're not activating the stabilization muscles of their neck. So instead of they went to the physio and said, well, the physio said, push my head this way and that way. And it turns out that shear load triggers their neck. The physio gave them poison. The physio mimicked their pain mechanism. So instead of doing that, we'll say, I'll just get closer so you can see my ugly face here. (laughs) I'm going to just touch yourself under here, Jackie. Now, it's soft. Touch your teeth together and push your tongue hard to the roof of the mouth. Now, grimace down with your face like this. There. No, no, you opened up and smiled. I didn't do that. (laughs) Grimace down. Grimace down with the corners of your mouth. Good. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> now you just, you activated yeah. all of the deep flexors of your neck. Now let's challenge them in a way that doesn't shear the neck. Mm. Sit tall. Put your fists under your chin. Now touch your teeth, push your tongue. Now add one kilo of upward force, but don't move your neck. There is zero shear load and I'm building your neck. So don't tell me, oh, I can't do curl ups and I have to put my hands behind my head to support my weak weak little neck. And I'll just say, well, you've just never been to anybody who knows how to create tolerance and resilience in a way that doesn't trigger your pain. Do you follow the logic? Yeah. Good. How how can we not know? It just blows my mind how you are able to break something down so simply and give an example of what you can do so simply. It only took 40 years. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, you've Uh, done the work. You've done the work, though. So I I have. So if I may, (laughs) uh, COVID did some awful things, but it caused people to adapt 
and sometimes in a very positive way. And what, what it did here at BackFit Pro, I never in a million years thought I could teach online. I truly believed that I had to be with the person and show them how to feel what I just mm. showed you. Yeah. But I didn't. I, I just coached you through Zoom. Yeah. And I've, I've become a much better coach using language and visuals and getting people to feel mm. in their own body how to remove their pain. And so I put all of our training courses online. So if you go to backfitpro.com, you will see the training courses online. And if you want to know about these various techniques on how to uh, assess, and I just gave you a hack around your neck pain to get your neck resilient so you can start training some core stability. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit of a house of cards, mm. but it isn't easy and you won't get it from the untrained trainer. Yeah. It, yeah. That, that, that trainer. No, we, we do have some, uh, we have one in Adelaide. We have one in Melbourne. We have one Melbourne. Did you notice I said Melbourne, not Melbourne? <laughs> yes. My daughter really lived cool. my my daughter lived in Melbourne. In fact, she was living in Sydney when COVID hit, and then she came home. But oh, uh, right. Yeah, but anyway, we have uh, some Aussie uh, expertise uh, there. But um, w you, you, there's no excuse. You, you you can get the material now, and exactly. I don't have to come to Australia and teach. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so let's talk bracing mechanics for runners and weightlifters, since we're talking about CrossFitters yep. a lot. Okay, what's the answer? Well, it depends, Dr. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, it does. <laughs> so do you notice uh, when you say a runner, oh, does, yes. does a 10,000 meter lady <laughs> sure. look like a 100 meter lady? <laughs> Definitely they not. are entirely different beasts. Agreed? <laughs> yeah. So do you see how I can't talk about a runner? I need to know, am I talking about a soccer player runner, mm. an Aussie rules football runner, an Olympic sprinter, a distance person? Because you'll notice one is good at one of them and not good at the other. Yeah. A sprinter will never win a long distance run because they've tuned their body and trained entirely differently. Mm. So people have to get this into their head a little bit. So now we get into bracing discussions. The power lifter and the person doing deadlifts is an entirely different beast from a person doing an Olympic snatch. The Olympic snatch athlete, not the crossfitter, but the person who is the world's best at Olympic snatches, you know that they are a speed elastic athlete, a speed elastic athlete. The power lifter is a brute strength, slow mover, mm. an entirely different beast. So again, a weightlifter, do you mean a recreational one? Do you mean an Olympic lifter? Or do you mean the adaption of a single Olympic lift into CrossFit, which now brings fatigue into it? No mm, Olympic C. lifter, <laughs> no Olympic lifter ever trains more than a double. Mm. They don't because they break form and they pollute the movement engram and the breathing and the bracing and the stability it all goes to hell. So an Olympic lifter only does one rep when they're training form. They put it down and they, oh good, I've just got success. I've just created the perfect lift. I'm gonna do another perfect one. The next one, single, they're getting a bit tired. They won't continue if they're an Olympic lifter because they're polluting the perfect engram that they've just put into muscle memory. Now let's go to CrossFit where the whole idea is to do repetition and break you down to break form and migrate stress to vulnerable tissues. That's a pretty interesting thought, isn't it? So is it that the most resilient CrossFitter is the one who can keep the form the longest? Boy, that's a whole different discussion of bracing. Mm. So we had the elastic athlete who did two pulses basically in an Olympic snatch, right? They pulse, stiffen, and then relax, stiffen and catch. 
speed, speed, speed. The greatest Olympian snatchers can turn on muscle and turn it off six times faster than the average graduate student. So let me ask you now, the bracing mechanics, a very huge part of it is to turn it on and off faster and faster and faster. And if you can't turn it on six times faster than your colleague sitting beside you, don't bother. You're not going to win the Olympics. You're going to get hurt. So now I ask you, the bracing mechanics, I need to know something about that crossfitter. And do they have hip mobility, knee mobility, a slow nervous system, and they can't turn the muscles off fast enough. And I'll say, how are you training muscle relaxation rate? And they look at me as though I'm from the zoo. <laughs> They've never considered this before, not realizing that that was the biggest impediment to them progressing without getting back pain and getting hurt. They couldn't relax fast enough. So they had to take it with their back cool, eh? So very cool. <laughs> but wow. There are so many people out there who've, who've got no idea, obviously. I mean, even I'm, I'm learning every day, every time I'm opening up a book or, or going into the CrossFit gym. How do we, I mean, we keep doing these things that Oh, it's so great for us. How, how do we, I guess, minimize the risk of injuring ourselves? The, the most amateur of athletes going in and, and doing these, these movements over and over again. And then you're not only pairing a, a snatch or let's say a, a squat, you're then having to do 20 box jumps or 20 burpees and then go back to the squat and then back to the box jumps and then back. Yeah, you just tuned your body to be mobile, and then you needed it to become supremely stiff and in controlled. So you just taught your body polar opposites, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, even, even, you know, go back to tr training the triathlete. You know, when you get off your bike and you start the run, you feel like a motor moron for the first <laughs> kilometer because it's an entirely different motor program. Yeah. It's an entirely different tuning of elasticity and pulsing through your body. However, I still get CrossFit athletes one after another here, and it's not my job to judge the sport. I don't think MMA is particularly healthy for you either, but it's my job to make them as resilient as I can. Um, can I take it back to runners? Yes. A marathon runner yeah. has no injuries has been training, has done several marathons in the past. So he's pretty, pretty good, but he could be better. He's a young, fit person. Bracing mechanics for this person. I wouldn't worry about it. The marathoner and trains their breathing to the running cycle. So breath every second stride or however it is they've been trained it. And uh, there's a lot of mechanics going on. So with each foot strike, there is a downward deceleration that assists the diaphragm in pulling air into the lungs. And if you don't entrain that, you're fighting gravity. You'll never win a marathon. So you just have to allow that elasticity and hydrostatic effort and compression work with the marathoner. Mm. Uh, we don't really... It, 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 we're tuning elasticity in them. We want them to be bunny rabbits or in, in, in Australia, we want them to be kangaroos. <laughs> so a kangaroo has a much higher uh, consumption, physiological consumption, if it just plods along. But as soon as it bounces on its springs, it mm. stores and recovers elastic energy. But if you're flaccid, and the muscles in the kangaroo are not pre-stiffened and tuned, they would just plop, but they don't, they, they tune. So I'm going to do a foot ricochet. Do you remember the nervous kid in high school who would drive you crazy? They'd bounce their toe <laughs> on the ground beside you. Do that. It's called ricochet training. You're tuning the elasticity of the body. If, they, if you turn on the muscles too much, it's, it's, it's a piece of iron. It doesn't store and recover elastic energy and you lose the bounce. If there's no muscle 
pre-stiffness, the foot just plops into the ground and you don't get the resonance either. So to hit resonance, which is what a marathoner or long distance triathlete is, is trying to achieve. So it's much more fruitful mm. to have a conversation about tuning the elasticity through the linkage in terms of a, a, a bracing technique. It's not a core, you know, <laughs> different like what we might have with a weightlifter or uh, a CrossFitter or a pulsing athlete of a loaded type with weights. Yeah. Interesting, eh? Very interesting. I love e it. Even even the, even the footwear and uh, strike mechanics. It, it's it's the type of track. It's huge discussion. Oh well, you've mentioned footwear. Now I'm interested with the runner. I mean, you get you, you've got some shoes. I don't know if you've heard of. I don't know even how to pronounce it, hokers or hockers. They're really dense um, foam. And then you've got other shoes that are just um, none of that at all. They're like barefoot running almost. So does that make a difference again when we're looking at the marathoner? Of course it does. You're, 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 you're manipulating elasticity, uh, tissue load. Uh, you're, you're tuning the body and the system around them. Yeah. So it's very important. So does 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 the shoe that's got a load a load more of sponge? Does that enhance the the bounding or the uh, elasticity of of the run of the runner? It, it it depends. It usually takes it away. It takes, usually yeah. absorbs elasticity. And what that runner does now has a great disadvantage. If they've lost some of the stiffness and the bunny rabbit mm. storage and recovery of elastic energy, they now have to use muscle. Yeah. So they concentrically contract on push off. They eccentrically contract on foot strike. And now they don't win. They're worn out. So yeah. if, if they're running a marathon, they're they're hitting the wall at three quarters of the marathon because yeah. they've been forced to use too much muscle or worse yet, they did too much stretching. So they might have done the runner's stretch. They stretched out the Achilles tendon. What were they thinking? The best thing they could have done was tune the Achilles tendon and uh, get better storage and recovery of elastic energy. Yeah. So yeah. Is, yeah, all of these conversations, they're, they're fabulous to have, but yeah. to converge with any single person, we need that person in front of us. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into the deadlift. Why is this such an important movement for everyone to be able to do? Ha ha ha. I don't know if it is. Ooh. I, th I think it's a tool that's popular right now. And it's coached by a lot of people who have no clue how to deadlift. So uh, should everybody be picking a weight up off the floor? If done correctly. I don't think so. No? no. If, uh, if you go on your hands and knees and then you rock your pelvis back to touch buttocks to the heels, yep. can you do that? Not you, but somebody. Can you do it with your knees together? Can you do it with the knees apart? Can you do it with the heels together in the frog position? In other words, some people you will find that they, they just can't do it. They start to impinge their hips. They, um, the next thing is look at every world-class deadlifter. Do they look like Michael Jordan? They have short legs and long bodies. It's a great, if I had to choose the archetypical power lifter, I'd choose someone with a long body and short legs and long arms. So the world's best deadlifters tend to be that. So would you take a tall basketball player with a short body and long legs and ask them to deadlift? Probably not. No. We know from the occupational literature, from the American workers who've surveyed hundreds of physical jobs, those people who have to pick up weight off the floor have a much higher incidence of back troubles than those who have to pick from mid-thigh level. So now let me ask you, why are not trainers doing a hip exam, which is probably the best determinant of uh, spine stress when you deadlift? Uh, you have the person lay on their back, you bring the knee and you try and push the knee into the armpit. You'll find some people it just plops in there. 
Others, they can't get past 90 degrees and they're already causing pain. And in fact, now the hips have run out of room. There's bossing the pelvis to stress the spine into pain. Um, so my, my, my point is those people should never deadlift off the floor. They should deadlift off blocks. What's the height of the block? The pelvic rock test on the hands on knees will show that to you. Let me, let me ask you the next question. You have a stay at home mom and the trainer, she tells the trainer, I get back pain when I pick my child up out of the crib. And the trainer has no skill. And they'll say, deadlift. what is the transference of doing a deadlift in the gym to picking the child up out of the crib? Is that skill transfer? The answer is it doesn't. You have to teach the stay at home mom to get to the level of the crib, maybe use a sandbag, gather in the sandbag and pull the hips through. An entirely different movement skill not given by a deadlift. So the transference isn't what many trainers think it is. The next question is, you have a cricket bowler in Australia. You're gonna get them to deadlift? You will ruin them. You're, you're tuning an elastic athlete. A deadlifter must uh, create supreme stiffness. Do you want slow speed? Do you want to jump higher? Oh, I, I've done this experiment twice. You can deadlift and squat uh, a volleyball team. Half of the team will probably jump a centimeter or two higher on a vertical jump. Now, that's a pretty important determinant, wouldn't you say, for an elite volleyballer? Mm. For a 30 to 40% of the players will lose height with a squat and deadlift program. You ruined them. You ruined their performance. Now, why? If you ask a simple question, and, and, and most athletes, young athletes will know this, you say, are you naturally quick or are you naturally strong? If you're naturally quick, you stand over here. If you're naturally strong, you stand over here. Now, you just chose who will do better with squats and deadlifts. Which group was it? Naturally strong or naturally quick? Oh, the strong will be good at the deadlifts. Good at the deadlifts, but you just ruined their jump yeah. because adding more strength and more stiffness made them slower. Yeah. So they're stronger, but they don't jump as high. Mm. The neurological sparky athlete, boom, 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 let's go. Let's add a little bit of strength. Their neurology can handle that strength and convert to speed. So when I'm throwing a shot put, for example, when you measure who are great at shot put, do you think it's the best deadlifters? No, it's the polar opposite. The great shot putters take the shot and continually accelerate it all the way through. In other words, it's that speed of contraction. So you train with lighter weights. Same with the discus thrower, same with the hammer thrower. So be careful what you want now. If you want to become slower and stronger, deadlift. But I hope you don't have any end plate fractures in your back. Mm -hmm. I hope the facets and discs are very tolerable and healthy. So you see why when you said deadlifts and I said, I don't know if it is, do you see where my mind then has to go to determine if yeah. A, is it the best tool to achieve the goal? What's their injury history? They're coming to me with back pain. And if you think deadlifts is the best way to strengthen the back, you're mistaken. You only activate the neuromuscular compartments of the erector spinae to about 60 to 65% in a deadlift. You have to do other things to get much more neural drive and stimulation, nervous stimulation to get the muscles to contract. Mm. So do you see it's a popular <laughs> tool among the unwashed? I've got a whole <laughs> bunch of deadlift questions that I feel like are completely irrelevant now. Oh, well, uh, it, 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 it may or it may not be, but, uh, you know, what, what, why, what, why is a person doing a deadlift with back pain when they should have been doing belt squats, as I said earlier, to if the goal was to uh, make them more tolerable on a ski slope or on a snowmobile or on a, a road bike, uh, the deadlift was the wrong thing. Was it the best thing for the stay at home mom? No. The over and under grip 
which is cued in in a deadlift. Why are coaches cueing this? You go to an over-under lift when you're running out of strength at the very end of your personal best and you want to get a little bit further. So if it's the grip that is the weakest point and you can fix that weak point with an over-under grip, you're paying a price with your back and your shoulders and you should be training grip strength and grip mechanics and learn how to use your hand and your fingers on a bar where you become, uh, you eliminate that as the uh, failure point and then learn how to bend the bar yeah. over, over, bend the bar, lock it in, pull the shoulders down into your back pockets, unleash the hips and pull a deadlift. Spine stability, non-negotiables. The non-negotiables of spine stability, well, there are the, 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 the three general principles that are non-negotiable, which are you have to build proximal stiffness because we live in a linkage to create distal athleticism. We've already talked about that. Principle number two, you need sufficient stiffness and the coaching cues are not always, but usually push your fingers into the obliques. Don't suck in. Now push your fingers out through muscular contraction. Build a big guy wire system. The third one is when a joint becomes damaged, it loses stiffness. So consider when you damage knee ligaments, the joint now has sheer instability. And a spine when it has disc injury or loses a little bit of disc height or disc bulge, it now has a sheer laxity. And those micro movements trigger pain. You engineer out those trigger movements with an abdominal brace that's appropriate. Not too much or not too little, but just enough to engineer out the pain causing micro movements. That's the third key element to tuning spine stability, and a non-negotiable. So there's three, but I'll go right back to say you have to be competent in an assessment. You have to be competent in choosing the best tools to correct the stability flaws that's robbing performance or resilience, whatever the case may be. And you have to know something about biological adaptation and how you're going to progress this or regress it, whatever the case may be, to allow the adaptations occur to create the robustness back again. Dr. McGill, this has been sensational. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. I'm sorry for the technical flaw. I'm sure it's my fault. And uh, we finished off in the started in the clinic and finished off here. But anyway, thanks so much for what you're doing and uh, supporting your people and all the great CrossFitters. Uh, uh, and what I mean, I have to tell you, I love the CrossFit community because I, I never get a one who isn't motivated and keen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're a fabulous group. And uh, I spend a lot of time there, but probably for reasons not that I want. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, thanks for all you do and your support of uh, our work as well. And if I I can say, if anybody is uh, interested, I'm I'm not a social media person, as people probably know, but uh, our our books and, and our courses are on the BackFit Pro website. Yeah. And you can see some pretty special athletes at the bottom. Yeah. We'll, we'll pop your website in the show notes as well and make sure we direct people there for sure. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Good luck to you, Jackie.